my name is Professor Graham Close. I'm a professor of human physiology at Liverpool John Moores University. Uh, I'm also a sport nutrition consultant who currently works with uh, elite uh, rugby union, rugby league teams, premiership football teams, golfers, and a variety of other athletes. So my background, um, we we'll probably go back to 1995 where I was trying to be a professional rugby league player. So I was playing for Warrington in that era and then I played for uh, Lee and Workington and several other professional teams. Uh, and during that time I got very interested in sports science. So I, I, I did a degree in sports science and as my rugby career was sliding downhill, my sports science career was actually beginning to take off. So I then con continued to study for my PhD where I began to specialise then in sport nutrition. Um, I then spent seven years doing medical research, working on skeletal muscle ageing, so looking at mechanisms to prevent the loss of muscle mass as we get older. And then I came back to sports science, sport nutrition, back at Liverpool John Moores University, where I wrote the master's degree in, in sport nutrition, uh, and I run that master's degree in sport nutrition, and now I work with a variety of sports teams trying to help them uh, uh, enhance performance and enhance recovery and that's a huge one these days uh, by optimising the, the diet and the nutritional strategies. Well, CBD oil at the moment in the sport world is something that you just can't ignore. Uh, it first came across at my door around about two, maybe, maybe three years ago when players started asking me about the benefits of CBD oil and I'll be completely honest at that time I'd not really even heard about it. I was having to Google what exactly was CBD oil and trying to um, get answers quickly to the athletes. And at that point, it was quite an easy conversation because it was prohibited by WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency. So the conversation in that era went something like, I can't see much evidence in sports. I can see where you're coming from because there appears to be a literature away from sport. However, at the moment, it's prohibited by WADA. That ends the conversation. Then jump forward a year to uh, tw uh, 2018, and each year WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency, release an update. So they, they tweak the, um, the, the legislation. Um, in 2018, one of the major tweaks was that uh, CBD oil was removed from the prohibited list. So I guess at that point, the, qu the conversation becomes very different with the athlete because no longer can we just say, well, it's prohibited, that ends the conversation. Now we need to start doing a little bit more research into it. It's really complicated in sport at the moment because CBD oil is not prohibited, but all the other cannabinoids are still prohibited. Uh, so I'm trying to find out a little bit more uh, where an athlete would stand. You know, what is the status of CBD oils? Can you actually get them without any THC? So are they able to take for an athlete? And even, you know, back to first principles where you know, is there any evidence that it is actually beneficial for athletes? I, I know of athletes who tell me they have taken it uh, and have reported significant improvements in muscle soreness. And that's a huge thing, particularly in sports like rugby. We, we have a little bit of an issue in some sports where players become over-reliant on prescription painkillers and quite strong opioid-based painkillers, as well as the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which have, you know, quite major side effects. So if a player's telling me that they're feeling less sore using the CBD oil and it's removing their reliance on opiate-based painkillers, it's something that I need to try and find out a little bit more about, which is why I'm having the conversations with, with you guys. An example of something that's been prohibited but now is uh, taken every day is something as simple as caffeine. So you, you, know, you need to remember that caffeine was once uh, prohibited by WADA, uh, which it was what we call a threshold compound, which is you could be, have a certain amount of it in your system, but once you went above that threshold, it became an anti-doping violation. And because that gray area was getting bigger and bigger, the, you know, the amount of products that had caffeine in and the dangers of a false positive, WADA did remove caffeine as a, uh, as a banned substance. They have it on now what's called the watched list. So WADA have a, a list of compounds that aren't prohibited but we're watching uh, to see the usage and check how they're being used. So caffeine is still on that, despite not being prohibited. Um, I would say the vast majority of um, athletes now not only would have tea and coffee type compounds, 
But we'd actually start to look at um, performance enhancing uh, properties of caffeine in the forms of caffeine chewing gum and gels and all sorts, or even an espresso taken at the right time before exercise. Uh, you know, and there's every reason to believe that maybe the way you see the CBD market going now where it comes in various forms, you know, in 10 years time, we might be talking about CBD the way we're now talking about caffeine. The current legislation with WADA is that CBD is allowed and that is the only cannabinoid that is allowed. All the other ones are still prohibited, which includes THC. Now, what my understanding is that THC on the WADA prohibited list is again, similar to what I said caffeine used to be, a threshold compound. We're up to 150 nanograms per milliliter detection in urine would be allowed and anything over that would be a positive test. Now, how much THC you could have before you went above that threshold, uh, whether that is the amount that is found in everyday CBD products, whether that's affected by dehydration, uh, you know, which is something that we need to think about a lot. You know, we all need to think about the recent cases in sal cycling with salbutamol were one of the arguments why a, a cyclist had high salbutamol was that post-exercise were really dehydrated, which obviously concentrates a lot of things. These are all the questions we don't know. Another important uh, point to consider from a wider perspective is that we know that with the supplement industry, it's not as well regulated as the food. And, and there's research that shows that if you used to buy any supplement over the counter, around about one in 10 would be contaminated with um, products that would fail a, a, an anti-doping test. So that's not just cannabinoids, and, and it's not cannabinoids actually. What we're talking about now is things like stimulants or band stimulants, and that can come from a manufacturing process. So any supplement we give to an athlete, we have to make sure it's independently tested for prohibited substances. So when it comes to CBD, we've got two things we need to look at. We need to understand the amount of THC in it to make sure it doesn't go above the wider threshold for THC, but it's also important that it's tested for all the other contaminants that could come in any other supplement to make sure that an athlete doesn't fail a doping test, not maybe for a cannabinoid, but for a prohibited stimulant that may also be in it. So at the moment, the fact that the only cannabinoid that is allowed is CBD, and I'm not sure yet can we get a CBD that doesn't have the other cannabinoids, we have to be overly cautious at the moment and be advised to athletes at the moment has to be probably leave it alone until we know a little bit more about this. So several athletes who I know and some who I've worked with, you know, have talked to me about bringing out their own products. Um, I, and because they are all, the ones I've spoken to anyway, are all sensible and they're all um, reputable in everything they do. But my understanding is that they're trying to do it the right way and trying to work out the safest way for, a, for an athlete to be able to take this. Uh, and I trust them explicitly in as much as you know, the reason that a lot of people are interested in this, or that these people who've spoken to me, is because we've maybe tried it and felt a benefit. For the everyday life, uh, the, the non-tested athlete, um, my interest is very much around pain. And, you know, and what we know from, not just the sporting world, but outside the sporting world, you know, we're getting older and we're living with chronic pain a lot, you know, whether it's arthritis or many other conditions where we've got a lot of pain. And we know that some of the very strong painkillers um, can have side effects. So, you know, away from sport, again, I'd be really interested to see if the pain benefits hold true. And if so, um, given that my reading is there's a lot lower side effects at the moment, but again, I'm no expert and I'm here to find out more. If we've got pain relief and if we've got very low side effects of it, well then, it's something that we've got to take a lot more seriously. Several of my students um, at the university, what they have to do each year is come up with dissertation ideas. So they'll come to my office and say, this is what I'd like to study. And whether it's because of the increased media attention, but this is the first year that I've been teaching uh, sport nutrition, and I've been doing that since 2010, where students have come knocking on my door saying, I'd quite like to do some research on CBD oil in sport. So, you know, it is growing in its interest. Um, and I think there is a growing realization that it may have a, a place in sport. As an academic practitioner, what I always want to know is two things. I want to know, is it practically uh, applicable in the sporting world, which it appears to be once we can get uh, to understand the world of legislation, we, we understand the CBD, THC thing. But the academic in me says, we need to really study this. 
and we need to study in athletic populations. So, so my pitch would be, you know, let's actually do it the right way. Let's fund the research. Um, you know, let's look at it to see can it help soreness, but also mechanistically. You know, a lot of my work will involve taking muscle biopsies um, and looking at the mechanisms behind how a product may or may not work. Uh, this has got a three-year PhD written all over it, and actually we could, between uh, the right people, fund the first ever PhD in cannabis and its effect in sport in the world, and how great would it be that the UK would be world leaders in that.